Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Martinson, and today we welcome Mark Skousen as our guest. Mark is a nationally known investment expert, economist, university professor, the author of more than 20 books, and the editor-in-chief of Forecasts and Strategies, a popular investment newsletter. But he is perhaps just as well known today as the founder of Freedom Fest, an annual nonpartisan festival billed as the world's largest gathering of free minds. Now, over the years, many Peak Prosperity readers have advised me that Freedom Fest would be a great audience to introduce to the crash course, as it's comprised of many independent-minded thinkers like the ones we write for and regularly talk to. In the wake of the NSA spying, IRS, and journalist wiretapping scandals, this podcast and this year's Freedom Fest have added dimensions to them. So I've asked Mark to come to the program, tell us more about Freedom Fest, how its participants might view recent events, and what we need to be doing about the direction in which our country is headed. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it's a real pleasure. Well, in order to acquaint our listeners with yourself, what else should they know about your background that I didn't cover? Well, I've actually been what we might call a world traveler. Grew up in uh, Portland, Oregon. My father was an FBI agent. My uncle, many people know Cleon Skousen, uh, is, uh, was also an FBI agent and uh, kind of the father of the uh, constitutional movement in the Tea Party movement and, mm-hmm. and the anti-communist movement and so forth. Uh, so I was uh, grounded in conservative political thinking. I've become more of a libertarian over time, but uh, I basically got into, I got a Ph.D. in economics back in the 1970s. I worked for the CIA, so I have a little bit of background in this whole issue of the All NSA right. and, yep. and so forth. But uh, basically built my career around uh, the financial world uh, starting in the 70s, kind of an upside-down world that I got involved in with uh, the financial revolution that went on during that inflationary mm-hmm. 70s and have been writing my own newsletter called Forecasts and Strategies since 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected. And so I've been writing my newsletter for 34 years. Wow. Lived in Washington, D.C., then moved our family. We we have a family of five children, my wife and I, and uh, still married to my first wife, 40 Mm -hmm. years of of, uh, marital bliss. And... We moved to the Bahamas in the 1980s for a couple of years. I call that life in living color. Yep. And then we saved enough in taxes to buy a flat in London. So we lived there for a while and, and then moved to Orlando to raise our kids. And since 2001, uh, living in New York. So we've I've traveled to maybe 70-some countries and during this time written about 25 books. And try to. Uh, I've been doing investment conferences for many years, and and then starting in the uh, about ten years ago, decided to start Freedom Fest as a national convention for all freedom lovers to come together once a year to learn and network and celebrate liberty or what's left of liberty. And it's been a a really it's been a great experience, and we're just growing every year. We're going to have over two thousand people there this year, so we're really excited about it. Well, congratulations on all of that, and that certainly helps paint the picture, so thank you for that background. Hey, let's start at the outside before we work into the particulars of Freedom Fest, which I want to get to. But when you look at the macro trends at work in the United States, which ones most concern you? Well, I think there's a lot of things that concern me, and one is uh, the policy level of government. When we fa- uh, Government's uh, in many ways responsible for the heirs, but it's not just government, it's economic policy based on what is being taught to our students in today's colleges and the best and brightest are learning still Keynesian economics that the only solution to our problems is more inflation, bigger government, and more intrusion in our lives. And it's most unfortunate that despite every effort by the Chicago School of Milton Friedman and the Austrian School of Mises and Hayek, of which I'm partial to, 
uh, we just have not made much of a dent. Uh, you know, supply side economics has had some some successes, but government is still very large, very intrusive, and it's both in terms of our money system, which I think is uh, suspect, and government policy in general, the interventionist policies, the uh, level of taxation. There's just a whole series of problems uh, that our country faces, and it's largely due to bad government policy that uh, has been taught in the schools over the years. And so one of my uh, purposes, just just as yours is, I believe, is to teach people uh, sound sound economic principles. Uh, and and uh, I've written a textbook called Economic Logic, and I've written a series of of uh, textbooks to try to reverse this trend. But it's still very much an uphill battle. Well, you know, it, it seems uh, much of the Keynesian economics in my mind. Well, I, let me let me be fair to Keynes. I think it's been. Uh, distorted heavily over time and and in favor of uh, allowing certain rationalizations to take hold such that now people believe they're associated with Keynes, which is the idea that government should run persistent deficits, which I don't think he ever really advocated. So maybe there's there's a little fairness to him that's due. But uh, when I look at you, you've characterized two big areas. One is the size of the government itself. And I've seen a lot lately with doctors giving up on the medical profession because it's just too complicated, because more and more rules get layered on top of them. Teachers giving up for the same sets of reasons. Uh, There's just it's natural for any organization, bureaucracy, even company to want to try and grow growings easy. But it's your argument would be that it's grown too large. In fact, that we've we're now additional growth is harming us uh, rather than helping us. Yeah, and I don't. I'm not a total pessimist in the sense that I think we're headed for an absolute disaster. I do think all. Well, we are headed for disaster, but it is reversible. I don't think we've reached the point of no return, like a lot of analysts think. Uh, but it, but it does require. Uh, you know, we're headed for a cliff. We're driving a car. We're in charge of the car. And we can make a U-turn, uh, but we're coming closer and closer to the cliff, and mm-hmm. we're going fairly fast. So we have to put on the brakes and enough time to turn around; otherwise, we go off the cliff. So I I like to use the example of Canada, uh, our neighbor to the north, as a classic example in the mid 1990s that faced a similar problem of government excessive government. I think. Government spending as a percentage of GDP was over 50%. The Canadian dollar was falling. They were running these huge deficits. Government was too uh, interventionist. And the Liberal Party of Canada, of all groups, the ones responsible for creating this crisis, said enough is enough and we're going to reverse ourselves. So in the mid-'90s, they they, uh, fired uh, federal workers. They balanced the budget in two or three years. And then they went on an 11-year supply-side tax cut policy and high economic growth. They had no financial crisis in 2008, and the Canadian dollar is back. So uh, it is uh, reversible, but uh, it's not going to be automatic. It depends on a change in government policy, and that requires leadership. And that's one thing we really lack right now. Nobody's, nobody, uh, President Obama is not listening to this uh, podcast unfortunately mm-hmm. and so um that's the uh, that's the problem so we have to we have to go to a survival mode we have to say we have to predict where this is headed the unfunded liability problems obamacare that you mentioned you know how is that going to affect us our investment portfolio our business our relationships uh and our standard of living well, you know, it's certainly at the at the at the higher level of this, I've seen uh, you know one of the Austrian quotes I really love from Ludwig von Mises is is, is to paraphrase it, roughly says, um, when you undergo a, a credit expansion, you either voluntarily terminate it or you or you face a catastrophe of the currency system involved, and that's what we've really done here. If you look back over the last forty years, and this is apolitical, this is independent of party because this has happened across all parties and and all decades. But we've been growing our credit 
market debt at roughly twice the rate of the underlying economy. And as an individual, you can't do that. You can't grow your debts on your credit card faster than your income forever. That breaks. And instead of owning up to that, what we've got is a whole slew of new interventionist policies from the Fed on, on the monetary side and the fiscal side. And basically, there's, I think the collective statement there is we don't want to have to live below our means to adjust for the period we, where we live beyond our means. We want to pretend that the, when, the period when we live beyond our means was normal and uh, something that could happen in persistent uh, perpetuity. And and how how do we how would we go about u turning that particular dynamic at this point? Would you think? You know, I I do think things are are reversible, but it is it is to some extent painful. There's there's no free lunch here. Uh, mm -hmm. When uh, it, it means layoffs, it means changing direction. Uh, I mean, take take for example the Department of Education. Uh, which has spent something like a trillion dollars since its inception, and and what evidence, what have we got to show for it? Uh, really, really nothing. Uh, the SAT scores are still down. Uh, we're teaching to the test, which uh, my wife will tell you, as a professor of English, is the worst way of teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. People don't really learn; they're just regurgitating what what they're told that's going to be on the test, and and funding dealing with these problems. So if you decide get rid of the Department of Education, which you and I and others have advocated for years, that means a lot of layoffs of federal workers. they got to find other jobs. Now, there's, there's a savings there. Uh, the deficit is reduced as a result of it, but there's still a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Individuals who are working for the government and now have to find gainful employment elsewhere. Yep. And so, you know, when Canada went through this, they did fire 60,000 federal workers and Canada, which is a lot of people uh, for for them, so for their government. So there is that pain that's involved, and the media is not going to understand it. They're going to complain. There's going to be uh, all kinds of protests. Uh, there could be riots in the street. Mm -hmm. And you saw what was happening in Greece and in Europe. That's a classic example of where people who are benefit corrupted, uh, uh, who are on welfare and so on, and you start cutting back on that, that's why we have, uh, when companies go through downsizing, they often do it through attrition. They, they say, say, well, make it a part-time job, or we'll, we'll show you where you can get a new job. There's all of these different methods uh, that are used to uh, minimize the pain, but you can't eliminate the pain. Right. Right. Okay. Well, let's turn quickly now to the other side of this. Uh, you know, you mentioned a couple of big trends, and the other one is kind of um, loss of civil liberties, if I could put it that way. Or let's turn now to this. I guess it's very much in the news, and it should be. We've got the NSA tracking scandal. Of course, we also have the IRS deal. We've got the journalist wiretapping. But looking at this NSA tracking scandal, what are your views there? Well, I think it's a major. Uh, frankly, I'm. I'm really. I applaud uh, these whistleblowers who have done this, I know they're, off, they're viewed as traitors and, and may be prosecuted for what they've done, but I think it's like the Pentagon Papers back mm -hmm. in the early 70s where we definitely need to tell government uh, that you've, uh, you've overstepped your bounds. I mean, look, I work for the CIA. I understand the need for secrecy. I understand the need for intelligence, especially against foreign threats. But there are plenty of ways to do this without this wholesale invasion of everybody's uh, emails and uh, telephone records. Uh, you don't have to use those methods. And in many cases, we haven't used those methods, and yet we've kept so many uh, terrorist thre uh, threats from uh, uh, plots from, from being carried out. So, I mean, I've talked to a number of my CIA people, and they have all kinds of means and methods of finding these things out that are pinpointed without violating the Fourth Amendment, the uh, right to privacy uh, with uh, the ordinary U.S. citizen. So I am very disturbed about this new NSA building uh, that is being uh, built. I mean, it's, it's a monstrous uh, multi-level building that you're finding out in Utah, in Bluffdale, Utah, that is going to be... Uh, collecting the big data, collecting the emails. Okay, they may not be reading it, but they're going to be collecting this data so that they could read it when they wanted to. 
when uh, when people like uh, Chris Martinson become an enemy of the state. Mm -hmm. Well, freedom and, and and privacy have always gone hand in hand, and and I've heard the argument lately where. Obama had said that, uh, you know, if you want 100 percent security, you've got to make some trade offs. So, you know, we, we have to be willing to concede uh, certain things and society has to decide where it wants to draw the lines. And the thing I, I objected to in that statement um, immediately was the idea that society didn't decide anything. This was done in secret. In many cases, I believe even the congressional and Senate people charged with oversight had no clue what was going on. So so this is all happening with secret courts with secret uh, rulings, and and in fact, they tell us it's legal, but we can't actually see the ruling because that's secret. And and this really harkens not to the principles upon which this country was founded, but but other more totalitarian regimes, I think, would, would have a better alignment with such an idea. It, in your views, do, you, do we really, or is the world changed to the point where it's worth it to give up our most fundamental right to privacy? And it's, I guess it's a privilege because rights can't be taken away. Privileges are temporary. For security, is, is the world that dangerous that we could no longer suffer a, an insult from a, a danger that we would have to give up something that's worked so well for us for hundreds of years? You know, I, I, Chris, I don't think it's, uh, it's so much that the world is more dangerous. It's just that the technology has advanced so rapidly that we're now facing a situation where with these uh, unmanned drones that can be the size of a um, mosquito that are taking pictures and, and that sort of thing. We have the GPS uh, that they're mandating, they're considering a rule to mandate that it be in every car, in every cell phone, so we know where you are at all times. The cap capability of the NSA to collect all of this data this is all new technology, and it's kind of like new military weapons. You always want to try them out. And so we even start wars to see how good we can use uh, these weapons, and I kind of think that's what's happening here. And the, the technology to maintain privacy is also growing. There, there are ways to <clears throat> maintain privacy in your email and that sort of thing, but it just seems like the invasion of privacy is growing faster in technology than the uh, uh, privacy protectors. So I think that's really what's going on more than and, – and they're just using this as a ruse, as an excuse – to use this new technology. Well, technology has a has a bad habit mm -hmm. of advancing faster than the culture uh, that, that generates it. And so it's just going to take time for our rules, our regulations, our understandings, our habits to catch up with the technology. In the meantime, though, the government seems to be saying, trust us, don't talk about it. You know, we, we've, we're not going to misuse this in any way. But the IRS scandal shows power gets misused. In fact, history shows that, that a power will be misused and abused. And and so I, I, for one, am not willing to sport a lot of faith uh, to technology that's so powerful. Uh, I think Stephen Colbert sort of nailed it for me last night. He said, if you're doing nothing wrong, you have nothing to hide from the giant surveillance apparatus the government's been hiding. Well, I've never bought into that either, uh, because uh, you do have something to hide. I mean, what if I asked you... Uh, do you have any gold and silver coins? And can you please tell me where they are? And can you keep, please give me your address? And can you tell me when you're not going to be at home? Mm -hmm. So you have nothing to hide? What you mean to say is that you're not doing anything illegal, but you still have things to... There's a reason, there's a rationale behind privacy. The other thing is, if somebody is looking over your shoulder... That changes the way you talk and the way you act regarding true. people. A lot of times you don't tell people what you really think because you know your voice is being monitored. And that's not freedom. You know, that's, that's a regulatory environment. That is what we mean by a police state. So I think this idea that if you have nothing to hide, what do you care is a, a, a really something to, to, uh, to reject. I, I agree. Now, let's turn to Freedom Fest. And you mentioned you started it about 10 years ago. It's got a couple thousand attendees. Uh, what's the mission behind Freedom Fest? Why would you start it? Well, I came up with the idea when I was president of FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. That's why I moved to New York. And I said, 
you know, we've never done this before, but let's have a national convention. We're the oldest free market think tank. Let's invite all the other free market organizations, and let's have a festival of uh, great ideas, great thinkers, and great books, and uh, have an intellectual feast, and let's have it in the entertainment capital of the world, the most laissez-faire city in the United States. Let's have it in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I mean, CPAC has its event in Death Star, which is what we call Washington, D.C., <laughs> and so we thought for as a libertarian movement, why don't we have it out in Las Vegas, and it fit just perfectly. We had 850 people the very first meeting, and, you know, I didn't ma continue as president of FEE, but I thought Freedom Fest is something that should should stick around, because I think in many ways we're all doing our own thing, we're all, uh, we're like a herd of cats. We're all going, as libertarians, we're all going in different directions, and we're losing. So it seems to me, I felt a, an urgency to come up with this idea of a national convention or a world conference, if you will, of freedom lovers, where we all come together. And there's, there's value to physically being together, to see each other in the eye, to talk not just over the phone, not just through email, not just through texting, not through podcasts and all the other things that we do in different directions, but that we come together. You know, we live busy lives, so we do it just once a year, only once a year in July in Las Vegas. It's a very hot time, so we have a captive audience. Nobody leaves during the day. Uh -huh. uh, but it's been growing, and I and it's taken a long time, but... I think now uh, we have a critical mass, if you will, because once you get a critical mass, then your growth can be like an atomic bomb. It can really explode. And I think we've reached that point because we have all the major free market think tanks coming. We have Cato and Heritage and Reason and Fee and Goldwater Institute and uh, Freedom Works, uh, Americans for Prosperity. They're all coming. They all have booths. They all have exhibits. And we have... Uh, other organizations uh, that are coming together as well. So we have a full exhibit space this year. Uh, and it, so that's, that's really the idea behind it. And we have in all these breakout sessions. We have over 100 speakers. So we have the top speakers like Senator Ram Paul is coming. Uh, we have Steve Moore of the Wall Street Journal. Steve Forbes comes for all three days. Uh, John Mackey of Whole Foods Market is one of our co-ambassadors with Steve Forbes. So we have, uh, we have representatives from all of these organizations. And then each year we choose as a theme. And our theme this year is, are we Rome? Are we in decline? Are we uh, like the Roman Empire, like the British Empire, like China, uh, like Egypt? Are we all going through the same cycle where we have this rise and become the superpower, and then we start our, de uh, our decline and fall and maybe even collapse. And that's the, that's the concern that, that you're raising and others are raising, and it's a very legitimate concern. This, this theme has really resonated with people, and I would encourage your, your uh, podcast listeners to go to freedomfest.com and watch our two-and-a-half-minute video are we Rome? It's kind of a preview where we look at the past and compare it to the future, and it's it's been rated a very uh, like the number one video at a number of conferences. Just a short two and a half minute video at FreedomFest.com, and people will will get a sense of of what we're talking about. Uh, you know what? I, we're going to link that video uh, at the bottom of, uh, of the podcast so that people can just click straight through to that. So check the bottom of the page; you'll you'll get a link you can click to there. Um, and, and so, are we Rome? I, 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 is that a rhetorical question? Or are you really going to? How are you going to explore that question? Well, that's right. And you know, we do put a question mark after it because I've done quite a bit of reading, and we have a number of ex We have over a dozen experts coming to address this issue. And, and by the way, uh, John Stossel uh, and Fox News is coming for the very first time. This is a real breakthrough for us. Uh, to have a major TV network coming to Freedom Fest in Vegas. So uh, they're also, John Stossel's uh, program is going to be called Are We Rome? And it is a question mark. So, you know, what, what destroyed Rome? And the answer was uh, an excessive foreign policy army that was very expensive, 
so that meant an increase in taxes, but that wasn't enough. So they debased the currency. They didn't have paper money back then, but they clipped the coins. Mm-hmm. They made the silver denarius uh, worth less and less. They had almost a hyperinflation during that time. Then they imposed state socialism under Diocletian and other leaders. So what what Augustus, the emperor, had established, uh, which was the the biggest superpower of its era, went into decline and, and crashed because of excessive taxation, excessive welfare state, the free bread that they were offering uh, all their citizens. Uh, they, they depended on a slave economy. Anyway, uh, between taxation and inflation and state socialism, where they nationalized the, the, the trade unions and, and the, uh, the mining, the, the mines and so forth, uh, it, it all fell into uh, uh, disaster. Now, on the other hand, uh, so we face all of those things. Uh, we have an excessive welfare state. Uh, we have monetary inflation, debasement of the currency. We have excessive taxation. Taxation is not fair. It's unfair to everybody. And finally, the reason I say it's a question mark is because we're not a slave economy, which were the Romans. We're not an agrarian economy. We're an advanced, technologically advanced, industrial, information-oriented economy. We're so far advanced compared to these other countries, So uh, compared to the Rome. So that's why it's a question mark, because, uh, and I think our economics, uh, we do have the principles of sound economics among a minority of economists, but maybe it will... Maybe people will recognize their problems and turn things around, and we could move to a higher era uh, of superpower growth. So I think it's uh, you know it's it's not inevitable that we are in decline. Although I think the evidence is that culturally and economically and politically we we are in decline. I would argue we are in decline, but I would also argue that uh, we have it in our power to reverse course before we have a collapse. Well, you know, the thing that I uh, I resonate with a lot of that, and the reason that I focus on the economy first, I also look at resources, energy, uh, how we're treating the, the larger planet in terms of non-renewable natural resources being taken out, waste streams going back in. There, there are a variety of things we can focus on. I focus on the economy, and the reason is that um, a lot of people have embedded in them this idea that progress is a one-way trip. Uh, that we will have better technology in the future. And that's true if and only if we have an intact functioning economy there to support it. Uh, it's worth noting that in the Roman experience, they had heated floors, spas, aqueducts, roads, arts, literature. They were advancing science. They were this cement technology we've not yet uh, duplicated. It's extraordinary what they did. And that all went away for a long time. And that went away because their economy collapsed and their society collapsed. And and so that's why, I mean, if, if you have a functioning economy, a lot is possible. Wander over to Greece today and ask the question, how are they doing? And and you'll just over there and you'll discover they're not doing all that well because their economy's gone away. They don't, it's not that they lack people who are clever or motivated or resources. Their economy has fundamentally gone away. So I, I truly believe the greatest threat we face in the near horizon is fiscal and monetary mismanagement. It's been cooking along for a while, but oh my gosh, if we if the Federal Reserve gets this wrong, uh, we could actually see great harm, grievous harm, both to our sense of selves, our, our cultural uh, cohesion, and most importantly, our ability to really advance the dreams that that we want to live into. Uh, you know, if we really want a, an economy that can um, function on alternative energies, for instance, uh, you know, someday we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. Eventually, you know, then. How are we going to do that without a fully functioning economy? So my view is is that it's the economic policies that, and by that I mean fiscal and monetary, that are some of the most grievous threats. You've been running Freedom Fest for a number of years now. What, what, what are our opportunities then to really um, affect positive change on the fiscal and monetary front in, in your estimation? How would we do that? Well, one of the things that we like to do is uh, we, don't, we don't like freedom, the attendees at Freedom Fest to walk away with their heads down and saying, mm-hmm. oh, man, there's just no, uh, we're just stuck, and uh, what, you know, what can we do? They just uh, wash their hands of it. And actually, we go, uh, 
go to special lengths to offer an optimistic vision. So uh, we have economists coming in touching, te- talking about sound economics, but also we have experts who come in, especially led by Richard Ron uh, at the Cato Institute, who brings in experts of, of countries around the world that have reversed themselves and have are on the word to success, success, like Estonia that has a flat tax and has a balanced budget and, is, and went through austerity and has real austerity where they cut taxes and cut the size of government. Um, hmm. That's not, it, not the false austerity that Europe is going through where they raise taxes and they didn't really cut government spending and it's counterproductive. We tell the Canada story. We talk about Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore, and Hong Kong, and the Economic Freedom Index people. I mean, people walk away from Freedom Fest with a new vision that, wow, we have in our hands the capability of turning things around if we can do X, Y, and Z. Uh, So we have a full three-day investment conference that talks about how people are successful in, in this environment. So uh, really, that's, that's one of the other purposes of Freedom Fest is to, to give people hope for the first time. And we get a lot of letters from people saying, I'm really glad I went to Freedom Fest because it, it, I couldn't believe there were so many like-minded people. And it, was just, it just re-energized people uh, for the first time in their lives to say, wow, there are several thousand people here, and they, they meet new friends and maintain friendships uh, for years, we, we even had uh, a couple who met at Freedom Fest get married last year at Freedom Fest. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's, re- it's really quite fun. And we do have the other thing we do is, and it's really important, is to have uh, uh, civil debates. Uh, as you, I'm sure a lot of your uh, listeners uh, watch Fox News or uh, some of the other channels, and they see these debates going on, and these shouting matches. Uh, we have debates, but they're all civil. They're all formal debates. So each person makes their point, and we try to avoid the demonizing that goes on, the left-right dichotomy. We talk about what is good policy and what is bad policy. We don't care if it comes from the right or the left or whatever. It's just, as Ronald Reagan once said, there's no left or right. There's only up or down. Mm-hmm. And I really like that that approach to... Uh, uh, Treat, treat everyone truly as an individual and respect the alternative point of view. And so it's, it's, just, it's almost a love fest, if you will, uh, that we have every July. All right. In Las Vegas, that's a good place to have something like that. Well, you know, it's great because during the day we have an intellectual feast. By the evening, people want to go out to a fine restaurant to see a great show or to do some gambling or whatever they want to do. It really is. Uh, it's uh, you know, it's a wow experience as 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 people have have reported to us. So uh, we're growing, and you can see why we're growing when you come there. Well, fantastic! And so, for anybody listening who is now hopefully very intrigued and and would like to find out more, where do they go? Well, we have a simple website, freedomfest.com, dot com, that they can go to. We have an eight hundred number they can call there to find out more information. We have a very uh, $89 a night for our room rate. So, I mean, it's a, a very simple process. Well, fantastic. So, uh, freedomfest.com, people can go there and look at it. We've been talking with Mark Skousen, and uh, Mark, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Chris.